Thank you so much for that, that nice introduction and thank you all for being here. I really appreciate the opportunity to discuss in, in, in my work and tell you a little bit about this new book that, that came out. It's an edited volume on, on the political economy of taxation in Latin America. And um, this volume emerged out of a conference that was held here in 2015. Uh, you know, some, some people here in the room participated in that. So, you know, it's exciting, I think, to see this finally out. And um, there are a number of collaborators that were part of this volume. And um, it included scholars, some of them were political scientists, others were sociologists, others uh, were historians, others were uh, working in um, international development institutions, think of the American Development Bank, for instance. So it, it's a nice collective effort. Uh, some scholars are based in the US, others in Latin America, some in Europe. Um, so I, I, I think it's a, it's a neat volume in that regard. Um, let me start by giving you a bit of a sense of sort of the motivation for this volume and why taxation is important. Um, what I would like to do today just briefly is to tell you a little bit of, about why taxation is important, what uh, has been done about it in general, what we know, and then why this book I think makes a contribution in thinking about the political obstacles that have often been neglected. Um, and then I will, I will give you a flavor, just a flavor of some of the main chapters or some of the topics that I, I just picked that I thought would be relevant. And, and I'll give you a sense of some overarching conclusions that emerge out of this volume. If you have any questions, um, maybe we could save them until the end so that we can have uh, you know, the microphone go around. But if it's something that you think you know, is pressing, by all means, feel free to interrupt me. Um, I like to show this quote. This is a quote by a former Guatemalan finance minister um, that is sort of explaining in a way how things work when it comes to taxation in Latin America. And even though this is from Guatemala, I think this is representative of how things work throughout the region. And the quote says, you know, it's, it's well known that in practice, basically companies keep three books or there are these three versions of taxation. One is the book that they show the tax authority, that when they wanna uh, underrepresent what they're making or even pretend that they're losing money. Another is what they show to the banks in order to get loans, so they wanna overrepresent what they're actually making. And then there's sort of a third book that reflects the true accounts. And, and these of course are secret because there's uh, no interest in revealing the true uh, profits or the true, how successful the business is and all that for the tax authority. And this is, this is in a way something that motivates this volume in thinking about, you know, Latin Americans I don't think are any more uh, corrupt or, or evil or, or less prone to paying taxes than anyone else in the world. But it, it um, speaks to the incentives and disincentives that are in place such that uh, Latin Americans tend to behave then in this way when it comes to taxation. So let me start by pointing to just a few sort of baseline um, conditions or, or points of departure that uh, we use as a foundation for the discussion in the book. And, you know, we, we think of, we know there's plenty of research that points to the importance of taxation and some of the salutary effects that come from taxation. We can think of consequences that are positive for economic development and economic growth. We can think of uh, good things that happen with taxation in terms of generating an accountability connection between government and the ruled or, or the people. And we can also think of the importance of the revenue that comes into government coffers for the government then in turn to do things that it wants to do, or what we might call state capacity. Now, we know the benefits of taxation. And one of the problems is that most of the attention has been by tax experts has focused on designing the right tax systems. This is of course important. Right? So if we know that there's a problem with taxation, we know a lot about how to address those problems in terms of these are the things we need to adopt, these are the changes that we need to make. Um, and we know that, for instance, in Latin America, we have a region with low levels of taxation, fairly low levels of tax extraction. Um, it's a tax structure that is fairly regressive. Okay? And uh, it's a fairly narrow base also, that not many people pay taxes at the end of the day. And by regressive, I also mean that uh, you know, we can think of a system in which uh, the more that one makes, the greater the share of taxes that one pays. And regressive is exactly the opposite, that in which uh, 
actually if one makes less money, one might end up paying more taxes than, than someone making more money. So we know that this is the situation in the region. And just to give you a sense uh, visually, how the region compares with the rest of the world, I'm showing you here a figure um, that has, you can think of the x-axis as reflecting the level of development. And as we move that way, we have uh, higher levels of development. And we can think of this as how much tax fiscal extraction is taking place. And all of these blue dots are just countries from around the world. And then the red triangles are Latin American countries. And the, the line sort of shows, on average, where we would expect countries to be given the different levels of development. So we can see right away that there is quite a bit of a variation within the region, within Latin America. But for the most part, most countries are underperforming quite a bit when it comes to the level of extraction. So Latin America is definitely punching well, well below its weight in terms of the resources that it can muster, maybe to provide public goods or, or redistribute wealth through the tax system. So given this situation, we know from tax experts that uh, maybe we should try to simplify the tax system, make it easier for, to, for people to pay taxes, modernize the, you know, let's say the equivalent of the IRS in the different countries, uh, maybe eliminate exemptions and tax, um, and, and maybe incorporate some tax incentives to promote efficiency, minimize distortions in the system, broaden the tax base so that perhaps we can get more people to pay taxes. All these things are very clear, but the political underpinnings, how do we overcome political obstacles to doing this, have often taken a back seat. And this book, in trying to address this, tackles three main questions. What explains the region's low levels of tax extraction? What accounts for the region's tax structure? Again, in thinking about how progressive or regressive the tax structure might be. And then what explains differences across countries? So if you look again at this map or this figure, you see that a place like Brazil is right on the regression line and uh, it's about what we would expect. And Brazil is the country in the region that extracts the most resources, tax resources from society. Now compare that with Mexico, sort of another sort of big uh, economy, and Mexico shows really, really low levels of extraction, um, even worse than maybe some countries that we wouldn't associate with, um, you know, particular fiscal capacity like Haiti or Guatemala. So these are the three questions that the book addresses. And let me, before I get into some of the details from the different chapters, just make a point to uh, show a little bit of the relevance of the, the importance of, I think, studying this topic right now. And um, here I'm showing you a figure that tracks commodity prices and uh, the region's fiscal balance. You can think of government budgets and how much government's spending. And, and if you see for most years here, these bars show basically government deficits. This um, axis here, the scale shows um, the, the deficit as a share of GDP. So, you know, in some cases you have over 3% of GDP of, as, as the deficit, public deficit. And then these lines track different commodities. So we, we have uh, metals, food, crude oil. And you see that more or less they fluctuate in tandem, right? So regardless of the commodity, we see the same pattern. So if we focus, for instance, on the black line that reflects oil prices, we can see that there was this boom period in the region, uh, roughly starting around 2004 and roughly ending around 2014. And, and during this period, we also see that these budget deficits start getting maybe smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And on average, the, re the region even achieves this um, surplus. And then when the price of oil drops in 2009, think of the global economic recession, we see this big drop and a corresponding drop in terms of, of uh, um, the budgets and an increase in the budget deficit. And then we see that this just tracks very closely. And the price of oil and most commodities um, the price has not recovered to the levels that we saw during this boom. Um, and in fact, what we see now is that 
um, governments have struggled in the absence of the windfalls from the commodity boom to maintain a level of spending that a lot of people had gotten used to during this period. Now, uh, why does this matter? Because if people get used to a certain level of spending and a certain provision of public goods and services, if you take those away, um, this can lead to instability, unrest, um, and, and we're seeing some of this in different parts of the region. So um, some of the recent protests across the board uh, are often related to government's ability to provide public services. If we talk about public education in Chile, for instance, or, or um, you know, public transportation in Ecuador or Brazil, different places, they're very much tied to this. So this is a pressing question. And unless commodity prices go back up, and, and if they go back up, they're bound to come down at some point, Latin American governments uh, need to address, address this issue one way or another. The other figure I'd like to show you, in addition to um, this discussion about levels and what governments can do with this revenue, has to do with inequality. And I think this figure, figure in a way, reflects uh, both an um, important deficit in the region when it comes to addressing inequality, but also a big opportunity um, uh, as to what the region could do if we overcome these political obstacles that are hindering um, setting up the right tax structure. So what this figure shows, um, we have two color bars. The blue bars show government transfers. You can think of maybe conditional cash transfer programs or different ways in which governments give money to people. And the red bars are direct taxes. So not taxes that we pay when we buy something, say a sales tax or a value added tax, but instead taxes that um, uh, people pay maybe through when income taxes or property taxes or things that are more directly related to government extracting, coming to you and taking that money out of you, which is a lot harder to do than you know, buying something and naturally just giving that to the government. But what we see here, this first um, set of bars shows the average for the European Union. And then the second set of bars shows the Latin American average. And then we see sort of a little bit of the distribution of transfers and direct taxes for different countries in Latin America. We see also that there is important variation here. But something that should jump uh, right away to you is the major discrepancy here when we compare European Union and Latin America, obviously in terms of transfers, right, government transfers, but also when we look at the red bars exclusively, uh, in Europe, direct taxes. This is the contribution, let's say, to reducing inequality in society. And direct taxes play a much bigger role in reducing inequality in Europe compared to Latin America. If you, see, if you compare this red bar here with this red bar here, you see the, the major opportunity that this represents for the region if we are able to overcome these obstacles. And then, you know, we can, we can talk a little bit about uh, which countries are where in terms of these contributions and how different countries might address redistribution through transfers or um, direct taxes. But I'm hoping that these two charts speak to both the, the major deficit that exists currently in the region compared to the rest of the world, and also the big opportunity uh, that there is to address these issues and make a, an important contribution in terms of inequality and the provision of public services and so on. So this book is organized along topics that have to do with taxation. So it's not organized uh, along the lines of specific countries, but rather these are topics that cut, ac cut across the region and uh, for the most part, depending on the topic, but they uh, deal with different countries. So some of the topics, let's say natural resources, well, that chapter has more to do with Venezuela, Ecuador, Bolivia, Mexico, uh, <coughs> Colombia, Argentina, some of the countries that are um, you know, Brazil that, that really have natural resources and that are uh, exporters of, net exporters of natural resources. And then, you know, we go into some institutional topics, uh, um, let's say uh, electoral systems and how these might affect taxation, right? And, and this isn't necessarily an intuitive connection. Maybe we can think about oil and taxation as a fairly intuitive connection, but when we're thinking about how electoral rules, whether um, we elect our representatives through um, a pr um, proportional representation rule, or whether it's a first-past-the-post or a plurality rule, these things have been shown to matter as well 
in terms of the incentives that legislatures have when setting up these different tax systems. So um, I thought I would maybe tell you a little bit about maybe four chapters and, and what we have here. These are not all of the topics in the volume, uh, but just some of the most salient. And then different chapters deal, might, might deal with two or three topics at a time, depending on the chapter. But let me tell you a little bit first about um, a chapter on natural resources. This is a chapter by Francisco Monaldi, um, uh, who's a, a Venezuelan political scientist who has, his research focuses mostly on oil. And this chapter looks into the debate as to whether the role that ideology plays in shaping how governments might um, decide that they're going to tax more or less hydrocarbon companies or, or just the extraction of natural resources more general. So the chapter focuses on hydrocarbons. Um, and there is a sense that in the region, let's say if we think about uh, Venezuela uh, with Hugo Chavez, or perhaps uh, Bolivia and Morales, with, in Bolivia with Evo Morales, there's a sense that, well, these are leftist governments that are in power now. And because of this leftist ideology, it's just natural that the governments are going to try to increase the government take of fiscal resources from these oil companies, let's say. But at the same time, we see that in other places, in, in Mexico and Colombia, uh, maybe non-leftist governments are going in the opposite direction. Right? Rather than um, increasing the role of the state in taking from these hydrocarbon companies, we see the opposite. They're bringing in more the private sector. So the question is, why do, are we observing this? Is it just about ideology? Is it just that leftist governments will increase the government take and, and right, of center, right of center governments will maybe increase the role of the private sector? And what this, government, what this chapter suggests is that um, maybe there are certain things that matter more than ideology. And this really comes down to um, the structure, say, of how contracts are set up at different points in time, depending on the price cycle of commodities, for instance. Um, it also depends on the sunk cost of in the specific projects and the discovery of certain projects, how much money different companies have already sunk into this, whether they're private or public. Um, but at the end of the day, one of the main uh, takeaway points of this chapter, I feel, is that the way that governments structure contracts when they're first entering into negotiations with companies, think of the, the accents of the world or the shells of the world, um, really matters down the road for the behavior of these governments in terms of how, they, how likely they are to, say, expropriate um, the oil industry or to increase the intervention, the level of intervention of the government in the economy in its industry. Um, a second chapter that I'd like to just say a word on has to do with interest groups. This is a chapter by Tasha Fairfield from the London School of Economics. Um, Tasha looks into the role that economic elites play in setting up these tax structures and in the levels of extraction. And there is a fairly well-established literature out there in economics and political science that focuses on what is often referred to as the medium voter theory or medium voter approaches. Um, and the, basically, sort of, you know, I'm going to simplify this, this literature, but there's this sense that if um, we have a democratic system and you have uh, inequality in, in um, wealth in this democratic system, if you have more people that are interested in redistribution because you have a democracy, these redistributive preferences will then translate into government policy that favors redistribution. And over time, you end up seeing greater redistribution over time. So by and large is, is this notion that um, in unequal context, democratic representation will contribute to addressing inequality. And Tasha essentially looks at one of the key obstacles to this taking place and that is the power of interest groups. Um, in Latin America, uh, she looks at these two sort of sources of power for interest groups, in, in this case, business groups. And she looks at what she calls structural power and instrumental power. We can think of structural power as the real capacity that, say, um, business elites might have 
to take their money out of the out of the country uh, and to really try to strong arm governments into maybe maintaining the tax structure a certain way or levels of extraction at a certain level. Right? And she also looks into instrumental power. What she um, conceptualizes as, if, you, if we think of the ways in which business elites will seek to influence policy through uh, perhaps uh, political parties, um, so representation in legislative bodies, but also maybe having their own representatives in important positions in the Ministry of Finance, right? Uh, or the, you know, the equivalent of the IRS, um, maybe through the media trying to shape people's perceptions and shape public opinion in terms of the importance of certain reforms that may or may not benefit the people themselves, right? So these different ways in which uh, elites, economic elites can shape policy outcomes because of the disproportionate power that they hold within society. The third chapter I'd like to highlight focuses what I call here state capacity, but this is really about a chapter that uh, traces historically how Latin America has made a lot of progress in terms of democratization. So Latin American countries have become more and more democratic over time, but they haven't uh, made a lot of progress when it comes to uh, liberalization. And I'm thinking, you know, I'd like you to think about liberalism in, in sort of the, the, the classic sense of um, individual rights and property rights and, and also um, you know, the importance of rule of law and the respect of certain um, rights throughout that for which Latin America has a major deficit. Right? So we may have uh, free and fair elections in a number of countries today, but we don't necessarily have the rule of law. We don't necessarily have governments that follow the rules. We don't necessarily have governments that protect individuals from expropriation and so on. So um, the claim is that democratization, unlike these median voter theories would, would predict, democratization has not translated into or, or has not fulfilled this expectation of redistribution. And that one of the main factors to blame for this is this deficit in terms of liberalism. Right? And that one of the consequences of this deficit is that you know, if you as an individual in society are not, you feel that the government is not providing quality public goods in exchange of your taxes, you're a lot less willing to think you're getting a good deal. You're a lot less willing to pay those taxes. Um, and that culturally, this in turn uh, develops into what um, Jim, Jim Mahon, who's the author of this chapter, what he calls lack of governmentality. And um, what, we, what he refers to as governmentality is really the internalization of uh, an understanding or a norm that the government is really the true, sort of a legitimate solver of collective action problems in society. And that because of this legitimacy, then individuals feel a responsibility to contribute to that effort through taxes, right? And we really do not see this in Latin America. We've had not only decades, but centuries of this deficit in terms of what governments do with the money that they collect in taxes. Right? Um, and then the last chapter that I would like to point out is one that has to do with public opinion. And this is a chapter by Juan Pablo Luna and Juan Bogliacini from the, the um, Católica in Chile and the Católica in, in Uruguay. And they look into preferences toward redistribution through taxation in the region. And what they find is that a, a, a vast majority of Latin Americans will favor uh, redistribution through taxation. So um, on average, across the region, about 70% of Latin Americans think that uh, it's a good idea to redistribute, to have these fairly progressive tax systems in the region. And if you look at individual countries, there are some variation, but for the most part, in, in all countries in the region, you have a majority of the population feeling very strongly about attitudes toward redistribution. Now, uh, they look into the determinants of this, or what might be driving people's attitudes in this sense. And, and we, we really, what they come up with is, is in a way a bit of a null finding that is uh, a very interesting one. And that is they, that these perceptions are not driven 
or these attitudes are not driven by maybe factors that we would expect would be driving this, or that at least in the U.S. context uh, might drive this. So it, there's no correlation between ideology, uh, perceptions of economic well-being, how, how I'm doing today in terms of my perceptions of the economy, and also no um, correlation between my own position in the class structure in society as to whether I would favor um, redistribution through the tax system or not. So it's, it's in this case, sort of, um, um, I guess, a, a call for additional research to try to understand why this is happening. But at the very least, it shows the contrast between the region in terms of, you know, partisanship is not necessarily something that might predict how people feel about taxation and redistribution, um, which is different from what we see, say, in the U.S. That if, you know, if you tell me you're a Democrat or Republican, I can sort of predict for the most part roughly where you will be in terms of your attitudes toward um, taxation and, and the role of the government in the economy and all of these things. So not the case in Latin America. So let me just finish with some general conclusions that uh, maybe derive from this book from the different chapters. I mentioned these three questions that the book addresses directly, one that has to do with uh, explaining the levels of taxation, a second with explaining the tax structure, and the third one about uh, differences across countries. So maybe I'll give you a flavor of the first two questions and I maybe will bracket the third one for now. Um, but um, there are some of the main factors really addressing this or explaining this low level of fiscal extraction in the region come down to maybe four, four main factors, some four key factors. One has to do with, we were discussing the power of businesses and the influence that business has um, in, in shaping uh, taxation policy. And, and something that goes hand in hand with this is that taxation tends to be a really low salience issue for people in Latin America. So, I mean, we can't blame them. Nobody gets too excited about taxation, right? It's not that people are super excited about this and they're out, uh, out in the streets. It's very rare when people feel like a particular tax reform really affects them so directly that they need to uh, mobilize and, and or write to their representative in Congress and all these things. So business elites definitely are able to leverage this asymmetry in the interest in terms of uh, taxation policy. Um, weak state capacity leads to low compliance. Again, in thinking about how there's this deficit of liberalism. And then we also have um, electoral rules playing some role. And this, there is quite a bit of variation in, in the region as to how, um, you know, the types of rules that lead to how countries elect, say, Congress or the legislature. And, but the idea, the connection here is that the more narrow the constituency, the more the legislators will favor particular interests, think about maybe business interest or, or regional very specific interest, as opposed to maybe a tax system that might affect some interest, but overall society is better off. So we can think of maybe electoral rules that uh, say proportional representation systems with large district magnitude um, are a lot more conducive to policy outcomes in the fiscal realm that tend to favor uh, sort of social, socially desirable outcomes as opposed to say uh, narrow districts with let's say in the case of the US where you have a district magnitude of one, you're like one legislator per district that, that really, really tends to favor these very particularistic uh, fiscal interests and why we end up with significant distortions in the tax system uh, that are not necessarily desirable. And then the last point I'll mention in this case is that uh, there's sort of government's low spending commitment in the region has made an important difference. And this might be explained by a number of factors. So, uh, you know, in this globalized world we live in, there is clearly a race to the bottom in terms of, um, you know, how much governments can tax companies uh, to try to attract foreign investment. And, and that is definitely playing a role. But um, after the 80s and 90s, there was a clear turn in the region to just reduce the government size and the government role in the economy as much as possible. And there, that consensus sort of remains until now. And it's been now decades of this consensus. And uh, for the most part, the, the norm in the region 
is a very low commitment to spending and this sense that if governments spend, you know, there's fears of maybe the specter of hyperinflation from back in the 70s or that companies are going to go somewhere else. There's actually um, very little evidence that this might be the case in practice, but, you know, it's still a consensus in terms of the economic elites and the government elites that are in place or in charge of uh, addressing these considerations. When it comes to the second question as to what explains the region's tax structure, this extremely regressive tax structure, the, the factors, many of them are exactly the same. It's the power of business at the end of the day that is playing a role, the slow salience um, in, in, for the public, um, weak state capacity that leads to low compliance, uh, their selective enforcement uh, by governments, that is not that they cannot really enforce tax regulations, but that they choose not to in many cases because of the distributional consequences of doing so. Um, and then the last factor that is a lot more structural has to do with natural resource dependence, right? And, and some countries fall in this category very clearly, but that also just limits because of this perception that in certain countries, um, natural resource wealth translates into wealth more generally. And that if there's oil in Mexico or in Venezuela, that means that people should be wealthy. And if they are not, that is because governments are stealing all of this money because of these perceptions of the relationship between natural resource wealth. Um, it also becomes harder to tax people in these countries where you have this perceived wealth that exists. Um, and that then why should I pay taxes if our country is already rich in this regard, right? So these are all barriers that are um, uh, important in explaining the tax structure. And then to the extent that we can think of ways to circumvent them or address them, uh, we can also see improvements in this sense. And one of the things that I think is encouraging about the conclusions from the volume has to do with the finding that there's a lot of stickiness to tax structures and taxation patterns more generally in the region, but there seems to be quite a, quite a bit of room for government agency in addressing these issues. So if we think about the room for enforcement, and, and there, we see clear evidence of selective enforcement. So it's, it's not necessarily that governments don't have that capacity, maybe they don't in some countries, but for the most part in Latin America, sort of middle income countries, uh, you do see that capacity and it becomes a lot more an issue of political will rather than capacity. Uh, there's also some room, of course, for improving, say, registries, you know, when it comes to property taxes, the, just the records that governments have of who owns what and how much people should pay because of that ownership, these are terrible. And it's not that governments don't have the capacity to generate these records or these registries. It's, again, a matter of there are important political costs to doing so. Um, there is room for agency in terms of improving the quality of public good provision. And then the more, the better the quality, the more people will be inclined to pay taxes. Um, there's room for designing contracts between governments and say companies, oil companies or hydrocarbon companies more generally. And how you set up these contracts early on will affect um, how, you know, how uh, cheated, let's say, people will feel down the road or governments will feel down the road as to what they're taking from these um, contractual obligations. Right? And, and uh, the last maybe big area where there is quite a bit of room for agency is in determining the spending commitments that governments might have. So the case of Brazil is a good example here, I feel. Again, Brazil is not necessarily a place that comes to mind when we think of if effective and efficient spending of tax resources. Right? There's a lot of waste, there are large bureaucracies, um, but Brazil is a country that has managed to um, you know, show that in Latin American context, you can still generate a lot of fiscal extraction. And one of the, the ways this has happened is the uh, Brazilian governments have, let's say, turned these spending commitments into law. And these spending commitments have been reflected in, have been incorporated into the constitution, right? In the 1980s in Brazil, for instance. And then by law, there are certain there's an expectation as to how much the government should be spending, say, on education and public health. And, and then you have this obligation that 
has, in the Brazilian case at least, then resulted in at higher levels of taxation. So it's not, at least, uh, there's some evidence at least, that it's not necessarily the other way around, in which first you generate the resources, and then you can see what you spend them on, or, or, or you have resources to spend on, but it's first you uh, institutionalize how you're going to address this need, and then you, f you manage to collect these resources. Uh, two quick things. You know, this, there's, there's a sense, at least from the chapters of the volume, that ideology is secondary to um, several things. And that, yes, ideology matters, at least in the short term, right? It's not that Hugo Chavez uh, nationalized the oil industry because he didn't care about ideology. There was clearly an influence there. But um, other factors seem to play a, an important role regardless of ideology. And you see a lot of leftist governments that feel very strongly about expropriation and redistribution of wealth, but that they, because of these circumstances, end up uh, privatizing some previously nationalized assets. Or um, So commodity cycles, electoral rules, public opinion, all of these seem to play a, a much greater role in, than ideology in explaining these outcomes that we see. Um, the last thing I'll say, is that business power seems to be crucial. The, the asymmetry in terms of different interest groups and the power that they hold in society, it seems to be crucial in explaining some of these fiscal policy outcomes. But the public does matter. There's quite a bit of evidence that the public can make a big difference in shaping tax policy. Uh, there are examples in which the policy, the, the public, it's not like the public will necessarily write to the representative because of this deficit of democratic representation in Latin America. But there's quite a bit of evidence that when people do mobilize and they feel, let's say, oh, you know, my value added taxes that are fairly common in, in the region instead of sales taxes, if they are uh, going up and there's a real framing campaign that, uh, an information campaign, that makes the public aware of this and how it's going to impact them. We have examples in which the, the, this mobilization has rolled back these attempts to uh, change the tax system in ways that are detrimental to the public. Um, we, we find that this mobilization tends to be way more effective than any accountability through the ballot box, at least in the Latin American context. And we also see that the, the, the way that we design tax systems and how we frame tax reforms matters quite a bit in terms of the mobilization that we can achieve and the understanding that so, so we can play with the design and the framing to alter this low salience that exists among the public in terms of fiscal issues. Um, and then one last sort of point that has to do with room for maneuver for governments that are really trying to go counter to, to maybe adopt tax reforms that go against the interests of business groups. Uh, business groups are not always monolithic. Their interests often have to do with the type of, of industries and, and whether we have exporting yeah. industries or importing industries or whether industries um, might focus on you know, more competing in terms of quality uh, or, or, or volume. Right? Um, and then Governments, sort of some of the most successful tax reforms in the region, in places like Uruguay or Colombia, have really leveraged these divisions purposefully. And governments have been able to sort of drive a wedge uh, between business elites to try to accomplish some of these outcomes. So I'm going to stop there. I'll show you again this chart that I showed you early as a way to conclude and just to highlight the, the major deficit, but I think also the, the huge room for opportunity that exists in terms of what the government, the potential for the government to um, increase its share of taxation and leverage then these positive outcomes that we've discussed in terms of economic development, government accountability, provision of public goods and services and so on. So I'll leave it there. Thank you so much again for coming and I look forward to your comments and questions. Um, if you have any comments or questions, please raise your hand. There's a microphone in the room. So if you could just please wait until the microphone gets to you and then, um, and then please, by all means. Uh, so I had a question about the graph that you actually just showed at the end. Mm -hmm. 
So mm -hmm. is that data based on, I assume it's based on actual revenue collected as opposed to potential revenue collected. Okay. So how does the potential revenue, do you know how the potential revenue collected from taxation compares to the actual revenue? So, cause you talked a lot about compliance and all that. Right. So is there, is it really the issue of it's just compliance or is it just, is it actually, is it a structural issue of what mm -hmm. their tax, their tax structures actually are? Right. So, so it's, it's a little bit of both and both issues play a role. There's a chapter in the, vol in the volume on compliance specifically. And, um, you know, Latin America, because of the way that's, uh, you know, these different class structures, there's a very large informal sector, right? In many countries, it's over 50% of the working age population is in the informal sector. And then the incentives become very different if one say is a, a member of the informal sector compared to maybe someone who is, uh, you know, a minimum wage sort of blue collar worker, right? And, and there are very different incentives, but um, really what, what I was hoping to reflect in this particular chart is that we can think of this line as the, as the expectation given the level of development that we can use as a proxy as the potential where these countries all of these countries should be somewhere here on the line. And we can think of this gap between the line and where the, the actual um, tax collection as a share of GDP is currently, and think of that as, as a potential, right? And obviously there are differences in terms of um, economic structures and, and factor endowments and so on. But, but for the most part, you know, we, maybe Haiti seems to be doing not too, poorly in terms of its level of development when it comes to taxation, but Mexico is an atrocious case, right? Or, um, you know, we can think of other places like Guatemala that for their level of development, we can think there's a lot of room for growth in this regard. So I think uh, I'm next. Um, so, uh, so the way that I understood a lot of what you talked about, you gave a lot of reasons why like the tax rates are sort of lower than we might expect, say relative to the line, um, and, and some of the factors that influence that. So I was wondering actually though, I kept on thinking about sort of from the opposite perspective of like, what would lead to the kind of political pressure that might force governments to actually raise taxes? And so I was thinking, like, so what about like, like political, like comp electoral competition? Mm -hmm. um, and unless I missed something, I didn't feel like you talked much about that. So I'm curious, like, does that really just not matter all that much or did I miss something? Yeah, uh, well, thank you for the question. And, and the, the, there is little evidence in the Latin American context that gains in democratization and in representation have actually translated into uh, improvements in redistribution of wealth and income through the tax system. So it's, it's a little bit of, um, you know, Latin America is a region that really does not or has not uh, conformed at all with sort of this median voter expectation that we might have and what democracy might do in highly, highly unequal societies. Right? So, you know, a place like Brazil is often used as an example as, as one of the most unequal places in the world with Gini coefficients of about 0.6, same with Chile and these places. Um, and in spite of, you know, we've had in transitions to democracy in many of these places, meaningful transitions to democracy since the 80s and 90s. And, and in some places, um, you know, throughout the, 19th, throughout the 19th and 20th century, sort of late 19th century and throughout the 20th century, there were periods of democracy that, yeah, they were punctuated and interrupted, but we would expect to see some progress in this regard. And, and we see very little evidence. So um, even though there is this expectation, I think, um, there are clearly other factors that are either preventing this uh, from playing out in the Latin American context or that would invite us to just revisit how this really works. And uh, um, in the Latin American context, interest groups, uh, maybe the, the lack of re sort of the, the lack of real political representation in, the, in, in terms of, um, let's say you, I, I elect my representative on election day and then this person checks out and is not interested in representing me and that, those forms of accountability that are very common in the region, right? So this broken link between citizens and, and rulers or, right? So I think all of these factors are contributing to this. Um, but, but I do think that 
where the region seems, where there seems to be a lot more room for improvement in the region, comes down to this point of uh, investing in, in the liberal side of liberal democracy and investing in the, the quality of the provision of public goods, in having clear rules, then um, uh, respect for property rights, these kinds of things that then might bring sort of, might, might bridge the gap that we currently have in terms of tax extraction. Uh, hi, Professor. Uh, my question is about, uh, from a, the point of view of tax evasion, um, do you have anything to say on whether the reporting, uh, the adoption of the common reporting standard affects uh, tax evasion in Latin America at all? Um, have many countries in the region adopted it? Um, has it had any effects? If, we, if they haven't adopted it, what effects do we expect? I'm uh, just curious in, in, um, in for, sort of from the tax haven sort of point of view, um, how big of an issue is it in, uh, when it comes to Latin American tax evasion? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, so my understanding is that increasingly countries are moving in that direction, but not all the countries have adopted it. In part, you know, it's, it has to do with the incentives that the ruling group has. And a lot of the ruling, so a lot of the members of ruling groups in different countries themselves have offshore accounts and tax havens and Right, so I mean, Guatemala is an interesting case in which there seems to have been a lot of progress coming from civil society to try to push for anti-corruption campaigns that are very much involved sort of the tax sphere. But there's such strong resistance coming from the ruling elites, and this rarely correlates with a particular political party or a particular uh, ideology within the political spectrum. So this comes from the left, from the right. Um, sort of elites that are used to enjoying the benefits of power and then um, engage in these corrupt practices have very few incentives to address the issue. So even in places where this has been adopted, um, there, you know, one thing is the adoption, another thing is the real enforcement when it comes to uh, compliance. So selective compliance has been a, a major concern. And what we see is that some of these cycles of commodity prices uh, correspond with the extent to which then governments are, let's say, forced to tighten a little bit this compliance. It still becomes selective, but, but let's say less selective when there's this real fiscal pressure that is coming from uh, maybe reduced availability of natural resource rents or commodity um, windfalls. Right? So, so um, Latin America has invested actually quite a bit over the last 30 or 40 years in improving the tax administrations, improving technology, improving in education and capacity building. Um, but, but you need political will and not just the technical capacity. And this is something that we still are lacking. Now, it may be the case that the electoral incentives uh, are contributing to then pushing for uh, maybe stricter enforcement on that. But again, we haven't seen this yet for the most part in the region. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I, had a, I have a question first about the public opinion result. And so those null effects, I was wondering, in addition to those, um, do, um, does political trust play a role in explaining um, redistributive preferences and how much variation do you see across mm. these countries in political trust and trust in institutions, not just state institutions, but non-state actors? Mm -hmm. And relatedly, um, are there, what is the role of non-state actors if there mm. is indeed this um, you know, low level of state capacity? this role of non-state actors in delivering public goods? Mm -hmm. um, and is there some process by which the state learns from institutions that might have higher trust in delivering public goods? Right, yeah, thank you. Uh, maybe I'll start with the second part um, that has to do with maybe non-state actors. So you know, Latin America currently is, is a region that is facing a lot of violence, not everywhere, but, but in important parts of it. And uh, this violence is often coming from organized crime and or governments trying to address organized crime. But there are large parts of the region in which 
these non-state actors, and we can think of drug cartels or drug lords or just criminal organizations, um, really have become sort of the state in many ways. And that uh, maybe this isn't necessarily in a remote part of the jungle somewhere, but even within urban centers, there are parts of these urban centers in which um, some local boss from some criminal group is the main provider of public goods. If we think of, um, you know, daycare services or, or uh, even public health provision, these things. So there is a real sense that uh, this is becoming more and more of a problem in the region. Uh, so for a lot of these, for, for a lot of people living in these communities, uh, rarely is there an exit option. There's, oh, I didn't like my drug lord here. I'm just going to go over there and I'm going to go to, to the state where I felt. Uh, and, and you may not even feel necessarily safer or better off with the legitimate government. You may actually feel safer or better off in one of these um, sort of enclaves. Right? So there's, I, I, I you know, and we do not discuss this in the book in terms of sort of the extent to which this um, parallel extraction is taking place. Um, there's increasing evidence that it's, it's a major problem and that, um, you know, problem for the government in terms of the revenue that is at the end of the day diverted away from the central coffers. Um, so that I, I don't necessarily, I don't really have an answer in terms of, oh, this is the extent of the problem. I think there's growing evidence that it's a major problem that uh, in important parts of the region is something that, uh, you know, governments have had to deal with. But even, you know, the, the case of Mexico comes to mind in which, um, you know, the price of avocado will go up in the U.S. And people are wondering, why am I now paying $3 per avocado here in the U.S.? And as well, it's because some criminal organization in Mexico uh, controls all the routes the, for, you know, the, the areas that grow avocado and then bring it to the U.S. And they have that level of impact. Um, and sometimes it's avocado, sometimes, sometimes it's tomatoes. But to the extent that you can actually feel in the U.S., the price of a particular good being altered, and and then those are legal goods, even more so with uh, you know illicit drugs, which is also we can think of as revenue that the government is not necessarily collecting. Right. Um, so remind me, there was there was a first part to the trust, right, and how trust plays plays out in this. So trust, um, my recollection is that in this chapter, um, trust is one of the factors that seems to be associated with the extent to which uh, people might want to, to contribute taxation, but, but also the extent to which people might feel that they can, they can feel comfortable with redistribution that the government would do through taxation. Right? Because that's, that's a main factor in Latin America. If you do not believe that the government is going to do what it's supposed to do with your tax resources, why would you give any money to them? So in this sense, I think that's very much consistent with sort of the, the tax morale literature and, and how trust might play a role. Um, so we, this chapter doesn't have any, anything that breaks from that uh, body of literature in particular, but um, I think it's, it's really more of an invitation as to try to figure out, well, what is then driving um, these very strong preferences for redistribution in the region if it's not some of these factors that we have traditionally associated with them? Right. Thank you. I think we have time. Oh, we have time for one more, and here's one more hand. Hi, um, thank you for this. Um, my question was about federalism, which was one of the topics that you mentioned. Um, did federalism play any like um, role in the case selection, or did you also choose like centralist countries? Um, mm -hmm. How did you account for like the different levels of decentralization and how that may affect um, the extraction of taxes from states to like um, in the different cases? Yeah. Right. So the case of federalism has to do with the way in which just different institutions and rules of the game might shape incentives for actors to behave, both from the population in terms of how they behave as to whether they conceal 
their income and how much they're making, but also the incentives and disincentives that politicians and um, you know, legislators might have in making decisions about tax reforms and tax structures. So the, the issue of federalism, at least the way that the book addresses it, it's um, similar to, or it's, it's within this notion that the more particular um, a constituency, the greater the incentives for distortion to favor a partic that particular constituency in the system. And, and you know, federal systems, it doesn't mean that federal systems will necessarily distort this, but they lend themselves a lot more to these distortions. We think of the, the US as, I think, a good case in which we can very clearly see how regional representation distorts, um, you know, the electoral college is a good example, right? If we, if we thought about, if we only had one district, the entire country were a district, and then that district elected one president, everybody's vote were tallied and all that, we would end up with different outcomes than the current system in which different states bring delegates and, right? So um, the mechanism is ultimately the same in terms of how rules, whether it's a federal versus centralized system, whether it's first past the post versus a proportional representation in terms of electoral rules, uh, how politicians are then responding to these incentives to favor those constituencies and that behavior will in turn shape tax systems that are a lot less neutral in their application. And, and by neutral, we mean um, whether they favor particular industries, particular groups, or particular social strata when it comes to income and so on. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. And please join me in thanking Professor Flores Macias for his presentation. <laughs> Thank you all for your time and I really appreciate your being here today.